is the Fight Strength Podcast. All right, let's go. Get the insight and perspective from two elite strength and conditioning coaches who work with the full spectrum of fighters from amateur to UFC champions. That's it, JJ. Finish it. Finish it. We don't just talk about it. Keep moving. We are about it. Don't stop. Let's roll. We live this. Come on, D. You're listening to the Fight Strength Podcast with me, Phil DeRue, and McGregor McNair. Good job. That's how we roll. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again for joining us on the Fight Strength Podcast. I am McGregor McNair. With me, as always, is the one and only Phil DeRue. This is episode number 48. What's up, Phil? How are you doing over there in Florida? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, I was just talking with you off air, but, you know, it's been a hectic week. You know, we got 62 fighters that I'm working with. And then uh, amongst all, all my other stuff that, got, that I have going on, especially with the meet coming up in two weeks. So I'm working on that. Mm. And, uh, you know, things are going well, though, as far as that goes, you know. So we're getting everybody ready to go. And, you know, it's a constant grind, you know. So constant good. grind. Constant grind. And things are going well for the meet, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm feeling strong. Uh, no real nagging injuries other than the slight bit of tendonitis in my elbows. And uh, so it's, it's been, been feeling pretty good, pretty solid. My strength levels feel good. Everything mm-hmm. feels relatively light for the weight that it, that it is. And uh, so everything's moving, moving pretty fast and efficient, so I'm good with that. That's great, man. I mean, it's always a good sign when things are feeling good this close to the date. Yeah, yeah. You, usually it's not like that. Usually you're beat up, you know, you feel like shit. And... With this one, this, I mean, I have um, one of my guys, one of my closer friends who helps me program, and um, he's been, you know, deadlift or he's been powerlifting for about 10 years now. So he helps me with that, especially because I don't really want to deal with it since I deal with so many others. I just go ahead and let him, you know, take over in a sense and, and be the coach for me. Because sometimes coaches need coaches too, you know. Right. So <laughs> at, the, at the at the end of the day, I, I, we we are we we have a mutual respect, and he knows what I need and how I do things, and especially he knows my my lifestyle when it comes down to coaching and having all these things going on. So he helps me cater towards that. Uh, shout out to Matt Levine, Levine's training systems, strength systems. You go ahead and check him out on uh, Instagram too as well. But um, but yeah, man, things are going well. Uh, Battle of the Bay is a USPA federation meet it's going to be uh february 8th so we got about two weeks from today and uh we're gonna make it happen <laughs> oh yeah now that's fantastic man i've also got a uh, just a, a small local meet that uh my coach ben and i are working up towards so it should be fun okay. so it's kind of like the same thing man i'm just trying to enjoy the process and just stick within my limits yeah. and make sure everything feels good all the way through I just want to get some competition numbers up, man. That's what it's all about for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. And Ben's a good guy. I met him out there when I went to Australia. Yeah. So you're in good hands with him. And you guys definitely have a good uh, situation, a good mutual partnership when it comes down to that. So that's that's, that's right. good for you guys, man, you know. And and good luck, by the way. Thank so you, brother. Thank let's you. Make, let's, let's set some PRs and let's break let's break <laughs> some old records and make it happen. You know? For sure, for <laughs> sure, man. I can't wait. I'm really excited about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so we, we got a few things to go through here, man. First of yeah. all, um, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, the YouTube channel, your Phil Daru YouTube channel is getting a mm-hmm. lot of traction. Uh, you're getting a lot of really, really crisp content up there and uh, people, are, people are responding really well to it, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be consistent, putting out at least three videos a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, my last video was on supplementation, my, my top supplements for MMA performance. So that's my newest video. And, uh, you know, just been trying to get as much content out as possible on that feed there. So if you are on YouTube or if you would like to see me on YouTube, just go to YouTube and just search Phil DeRue. You could, my, my page will pop up and you can see all the videos I got out there. I'm trying to produce at least three a week. So it is going to be consistent, con- you know, consistent content that you guys can uh, all enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's probably worth pointing out as well that this podcast is, is put yep. up, is put up uh, live on YouTube. Well, not live, but you know what I mean? Like the recording is yep. up on YouTube on Phil DeRue's channel. Mm-hmm. So get across and check out the video of this podcast and all of Phil's uh, exercise and supplementation videos out there. 
Uh, there's some really, really incredible stuff, even for myself. Um, I've been doing this for over 10 years and every single time I'm picking up new tips and tricks from Phil, he's constantly got his finger on the pulse and he's constantly learning and developing and growing as a coach. And I think that's what we all need to be, man, seriously. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think if you don't evolve and you don't set yourself in another way as far as you know getting out there and learning each and every day, then obviously you're never going to grow and you're never going to get better. So for me, I'm always trying to learn and you you the same way, man. We're always trying to evolve and get new ideas and, and new studies out there and learn from everybody. You know, it's not just, you know, one track minded. You want to make sure you're taking things from every every situation so that you could put it in your own context and for your own subjective matter. So I think that that was very important. Um, especially for all you young coaches out there, make sure that you're doing that. And uh, never think that you know too much. Trust me, mm. you do not. And I know that I don't know. And if that's the case, then you guys got to get on the ball and let's make this happen and just keep on learning. That's right. That's exactly right. And I mean, <clears throat> there's no one system, man. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands of systems for doing what we do. Um, but there's no one system. There's no one size fits all. You can't ever learn too many of these systems and apply what works to your particular situation. Yeah, I think if you, in this game, you've got to have an unbiased approach. You know, it's good to believe in the system. It's good to believe in certain things. And you should have a prince. You should have principles and you should have your quote unquote philosophy. But at the same time, you should always, you know, understand all types of methodologies and periodization models and know when to put them in the right place. Hmm. That's the problem. A lot of the times is people kind of get stuck on one specific method and thinking that that's the only one that they need to do and it may not work and I and that's going to be something that a lot of the young coaches need to realize as well is that just because you think that one thing has worked in the past doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in the future so you got to make sure that you know every every way of doing something and understand the context, understand the situation, the circumstances so that you can plug and play when necessary. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And it's the kind of thing that takes years to develop. And what I found is that experimentation, like taking a concept or a principle or a system, you know, reinterpreting it or trying it out <sighs> in, you know, in every way that you can so you fully understand its application within your setting. It takes years of experimentation to get good at this. I see some young coaches actually recently, I was talking to a young coach who pulled an internet off, off uh, pulled a, a, a program off the internet and, uh, and mm. tried to apply it straight away. It didn't work for him and he said it was shit. Now this is a program I know, uh. this is a program I know pretty well. This is German volume. Actually, you just put out a video on German volume recently. And I, know I actually did. It's on. <laughs> if if you stick if you stick to the parameters and play by the rules with German volume, you will see sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. That is just the the oh, golden sure. rule. But when when yeah. you when you start to leave things out, like you know, dropping rest periods, adding too much work on top of those primary sets, you you, you know, you're mm -hmm. messing with a winning formula. And chances are, sure. it's it's not going to work. And this is where experimentation yeah. comes in. Well, and also you have to understand what you're trying to get from an adaptation standpoint. You That's know, um, I can do a form. I can do a form of German volume training with a form of lactate retention method. Mm. So I'm using two of these models together to enhance a certain type of adaptation, right? And you got to know when to put it in the right context. Again, we go back to that. But and you have to know the situation. You have to know where they're at, whether it be whatever athlete you're working with, if they're in season, out of season, if they're they're fighters, if they're in camp, out of camp. You've got to know when to put these things into place. Mm. And then you got to know what actually is going to mesh well with them. Like for me, I just put out on YouTube a German volume training as well, because we usually do this once or I should say once every other week to once every week for my off camp people that are, you know, you know relatively about nine, maybe even 12 to nine weeks out, mm -hmm. primarily, getting right into camp, because this is really where we're trying to build up that sarcoplasmic, that myofibrillary hypertrophy. We're trying to build up um, efficiency of lifting when it comes to the exercises that we choose, especially with the compound lifts that we use. Mm. 
So I'm trying to work on technical efficiency. I'm trying to work on bringing up that 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 solid structural integrity and and building muscle. You know, so we can build armor for the for the camp itself. Mm. And uh, using what we call lactate retention model, which I use from which I took from triphasic training, Caldi's triphasic, is that basically what you're doing is in between your set, 30 seconds and you're resting about 90 seconds, within those 30 seconds, you're doing somewhat of an active recovery sitting in an isometric position or stance or whatever the case. Let's say if you're doing a squat, you're gonna sit into an isometric squat and hold that lactate in the muscle so that you can produce it or actually help buffer it, potentiate into buffering it later on down the line. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, we've seen tremendous increases in overall ability to buffer lactate going down Mm -hmm. further once you know, they get that ability to do that, right? So, um, but yeah, it takes it takes it takes time. You know, you gotta you gotta spend an ample amount of time. It, usually, it's about two to three weeks. Consistently, you'll see a difference there, and that's that's you know, case studies shown from triphasic training and from my own practice. I've seen it from a practical application standpoint. Mm-hmm. But I'm going in on a rant there. No, what I'm good. basically saying is that you know, basically. <clears throat> you got to know when to put things in place and why you're trying to do something, right? Mm. So understanding short-term stimulus to create that long-term adaptation mm-hmm. is going to be a key factor when you're talking about overall progression of your athlete. So was he doing it the correct way? Probably not. If he was, or did he put it in the right context? Was he working with the right athlete? Mm-hmm. Probably not. So that's why it didn't work for him. To totally negate that and say that it's shit, it doesn't work for anybody, is very ignorant it's, it's very rookie it's very yeah i was good that's a good word <laughs> yeah it's yeah. very ignorant you know yeah. and, and and it's unfortunate that he's probably a young kid right Pretty yeah much. He's, he's about 23 24 and i don't know him very well but i can tell you this mm-hmm. i guarantee the the parameter that he left out was the frequency of lifting right so you, you can't yeah. you can't just lift german volume in this example you can't just lift that modality two times per week, upper body and lower body. It doesn't work like that. The stimulus has to be much more frequent. Um, oh, yeah. Charles Poliquin popularized a five-day split, right? So three, se- three sessions on a five-day split. And, uh, and that mm-hmm. kind of frequency, doesn't matter what you're doing, is gonna yield results. So my mm-hmm. argument would be, my argument was to this young guy, whatever you're doing, if you're only doing it twice a week, how much improvement can you realistically expect well and it also really depends on the uh the overall like time they've been in the gym right the experience in the weight room Mm. muscular experience like how much strength do they actually have Uh, with my guys and girls any new stimulus is going to cause an adaptation yeah anything we put on their body they're going to cause some growth any type of volume that we put they're going to gain some muscle because they they just haven't done it for too long, mm. right? The longer you do something, the harder it is to get an adaptation. That's right. right? Dim- diminishing returns. Yes. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. for my for my individuals, we may not have to do it that much. I'm still getting I'm still getting results, mm. right? Not to say that Charles was wrong. Charles is probably right, no matter what. But what I'm saying is that I know the MRV for my athletes, and I know exactly what worked, and this is what's working for right now. The great thing there is that we're seeing adaptations. Mm-hmm with lesser frequency. So when we put more frequency on, when they start to get better, when they start to get stronger, build more muscle, mm. you know, and, then, and, and that's in the case of not getting out of the weight class and things like that. And obviously it's gonna be off camp. Very complicated, but yeah. Yeah, it, it becomes pretty complicated when, it, when you're talking about that. But as long as we can get, two things I'm working to get is technical efficiency of the lift, yep, of course. understanding it because you're, pra- you're practicing it. It's 10 by 10, you're practicing it, you know on top of the added benefit of structural integrity, you know, joint restoration technique, and also hypertrophy, building muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm cool with that, I like it, you know? Um, but like I said, you have to know the recoverable volume of your athlete, you have to know when to to put more on or take more off. Yep, you know? exactly, so, and, and this is the kind of thing, um, I know you and I have spoken about this in previous episodes, but when you're dealing with athletes, especially like the level you're dealing with, these guys have so many training units in a week and there's mm-hmm. only so much stress stimulus they can you know, realistically um, recover from. 
So, I mean, all, yeah, of, yeah. all of these come into play. And, you know, are you going to sacrifice all of these other things like recovery for this yeah. one for this one adaptation you're trying to hit, which is hypertrophy, which in most yeah. cases takes a lot of frequency to actually develop. So, you know, yeah, it's if you want to train for hypertrophy uh, for a fighter of that caliber, then you've got to be super careful where that stimulus goes within the training year or within the training cycle because everything like that comes at a cost. Yeah, definitely. If they're too sore, if they're too sore to spar, if they're too sore to roll, you know, if they're too sore to do their skills practice events, that's obviously going to be a problem. We don't want that. Mm. And at the same time, we don't want them to be so sore and so tight that they end up tearing something yeah. when they're doing their movement. So with that, putting proper recovery methods in place, you know, doing things like a restorative practice afterwards, whether it be just, you know, sled walks or, you know, um, just some light pump work, whether it be with bands and some light dumbbells, something like that to get movements, to get blood flow, that's definitely going to help. And then also restorative methods like ice bath, like massage, mm. like those things. Now, obviously, if they're off camp, if we're trying to build hypertrophy, we don't want to put them in an ice bath because it is going to bring down the uh, the inflammation, which is going to decrease the level of hypertrophy we can gain. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to do that. But something like a sauna, so that could be that could be beneficial to bring down cortisol, to bring their body back to parasympathetic, diaphragmatic breathing techniques that we talked about before. And then, like I always said, just some light aerobic aerobic capacity work, mm -hmm. something that's not too strenuous, keeping the heart rate around 40 to 60% max heart rate, something very light, and do it for about 20 to 30 minutes. Then we can go ahead and restore that uh, that that fatigue that was built up. We can make sure that we're gaining uh, more progressions throughout the weeks and throughout the days, going further into camp and out of camp, obviously. Now, I don't mind if they're a little sore or out of camp, mm -hmm. but we don't want them to be debilitated. We don't want them to not be able to practice. Yeah. But you're definitely gonna have to start, especially when you get into camp, you have to start to put in those means of recovery. Otherwise, they're not gonna be able to practice and that's not gonna be a good thing. Exactly, and then, then all the rest of the coaches start coming at you, right? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's something that, it doesn't matter if they sore, if they're sore, or if they're not sore. They may come after me anyways, uh, because it always is going to be the strength and conditioning coach's fault. <laughs> always. <laughs> but, yeah, but at the end of the day, we're just we're just trying to we're a small piece of the puzzle, right? We're a yep. small part of a a, a, a bigger picture. And uh, we have to make sure that we're properly putting everything in place for them to be successful, to not, you know, to negate or to mitigate injury, especially non-contact injury, and to make them a better athlete, which is going to in turn make them a better fighter, yep. right? So movement quality, the ability to produce force, the ability to absorb force, and, and obviously making sure that they are structurally stable and able to take blows or get blows, yeah, right? Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, like you are essentially life insurance for a fighter's career as a strength and conditioning mm -hmm. coach. You know, the, the, more, the more a fighter invests in, like you say, structural integrity, injury prevention, the longer and the healthier and the more money they're gonna make in their career. I mean, you know, yeah. there's, it's more than just a performance uh, outcome that, that we serve as strength and conditioning coaches. I think it's a much bigger picture than that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny because for me, you know, that's almost everything that I do because of the guys and girls that I work with, they're at the highest level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, today was, you know, predicated towards more we call a repetition day or just a recovery day where we were working on small joints and, and working on joint restoration and some aerobic capacity work and just some regular corrective exercises to get them feeling better, you know. So mm. that was something that, you know, that we utilize as, a, as especially at the end of the weeks when they're, when they're, you know, going, they finished all their training throughout the week. It's a good day to do your mobility. It's a good day to do that joint restoration, to get that aerobic capacity work in just for one to obviously decay fatigue and then also to help with any other things that we miss throughout the week. Mm. So that's something that I use. Um, that's, that's a longevity approach, right? So that's what, that's what we use. That's kind of like our longevity day. 
Yeah, it's so useful. So it's necessary, you know, I think um, there's so, <clears throat> so many applications for it. Now, speaking of uh, applications, um, in my WhatsApp application, I have a video that you, <laughs> that you sent to me of, uh, mm. I think it was from your Instagram feed. Somehow you did some wizardry with your mobile phone and you recorded yourself flicking through, <laughs> flicking through all of the fucking questions that you got sent. No, no, no. What happens is, is like <laughs> what you can do is, let me tell you, let me go ahead and school you on Instagram, right? So oh. <laughs> you, you just, all you got to do is save the Instagram story and it just so happened that my whole story was, you know, fluttered with questions. So yeah, there was a few. You got there. all of my questions. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> so, uh, so I, yeah, I just sent them over instead of just taking pictures of them. I just sent the whole video over. Oh, that's so. that's cool, man. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll always uh, take lessons from you on Instagram, man. I'm still, I'm still in the Stone Ages with that shit, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. So I'll go ahead. I mean, there's. We'll go over some questions here and we can elaborate and actually get, you know, your thoughts on it too as well. But I got a question that like, it was like one of the first or second questions or something like that, but it was, a, what's your three essential strength exercises for wrestling and MMA in general? So you want to take this one first? Cause I already answered it. You already answered it. Okay. So, well, first, my first answer to that is it depends, man. You got uh, different, different uh, bioenergetic demands for the sport. Um, mm -hmm. since I've very limited experience working with wrestlers, pure wrestlers, um, I'm going to, yeah, there's not a lot of wrestling, no. not a lot of wrestling in Australia. No, there's not. <laughs> I, I, th I think, I think I know one or two pure wrestlers <laughs> here in Australia. Yeah. No, I know more than that, but just not that well. It's, uh, it's very unpopular here. Um, so yeah. three essential exercises. Okay. So you've got to have a squat pattern. You've got to have a hip, hip hinge pattern and you've got to have some kind of ballistic upper body pattern. Um, depending on the, the grappling discipline, um, I would say an upper body pull, like a, like a chin up, I'd always try and stick to a, a neutral grip chin up, just, just a, at a base level uh, for any, any kind of grappling. Um, and depending on the grappling style, um, as in whether in jiu-jitsu, if, if you're a, a top pressure player or if you're, if you're a guard player, I mean, there's very different, very different bioenergetic demands for those things. So, um, mm. you know, it's, it's a big looping answer to a, to a pretty basic question. Um, so, I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to put it down to a squat pattern, a hip hinge pattern, and uh, yeah. a ballistic upper body pattern. Okay, all right, perfect. Because I kind of said the same thing and how I went about it. I was like, it's dependent upon the situation, but generally, it would be some sort of a squat, and you know I'm going to pick something like a front squat or yeah, a zercher squat. squat yeah. um, I love good mornings. I feel like that's something that's it's not put in enough, especially in combat sports. Um, I've seen tremendous increases in our overall strength from the posterior chain doing good mornings. Yep. So we live on good mornings right now. Um, sumo deadlifts for the hips, because a lot of the times these guys – have strong lower backs, but not strong enough hips and hamstrings. Yeah. Because they, they neglect that. Uh -huh. right? They're more quad dominant. Um, Pendulate rows. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because you're, you're, you're creating force from a dead stop, right? And most of the time, it's a static overcome dynamic in wrestling, right? You're holding and then you're exploding. Things like that. And you have to have that pulling power. You have to have that posterior chain, that back power. So I use that. I would say that would be one of my main rowing movements. Um, I do like, and uh, I do like, you know, if they have the prerequisites to do it, especially with the shoulder, a lot of wrestlers have shitty shoulders, have terrible external rotation. Mm -hmm. So I don't do a whole lot of pull-ups mm -hmm. just because it ends up torquing their shoulder and their elbow and they end up getting tendonitis that way. Sure. So if I can, I may do a neutral grip with, let's say, a V bar and you can stack it on top and then you pull from there or I'll go ahead and tie towel around the bar and they pull and use a grips yep, yep. to pull with the towel. Now it gives you more free range to actually use that rotation from supinated to pronated or pronated to supinated. Um, and uh, what else? What else? I mean, he said three. But I had way more, you know what I'm saying? Know, and it always is. You've got like 12, it always, man. <laughs> it's always dependent, man. Listen. 
you got to know, and, and all my interns and everybody who's worked with me knows that I have a large exercise pool mm-hmm. because I'm not in love with anything. I mean, people think that I'm the Zercher Squad guy now, but at the end of the day, I just want, I just like what fits the athlete. I like what's going to be beneficial and what has, what is going to give them the best bang for their buck, what is going to be efficient and effective. And that's, that's why I have so many exercises, you know what I mean? So... Mm-hmm. But like I said, it has to stick to the standard hinge, squat, push, pull, you know, some type of rotation, things like that. Yeah, agreed. Good question. Thank you. Thank you for that one. What else you got, man? All right, let me go back. Hold on. Okay. Here's a good one. <laughs> You're going to like this one. Best way to improve arm endurance. Oh, okay. Arm endurance. Okay. Dominant or non-dominant arm? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just, all right, I'm going to get just say upper body endurance. Let's okay. put it like that. Okay. So uh, straight away, I I dive into my Poliquin group training um, and education. There's uh, there's a strength quality by the name of strength endurance, and there's numerous different ways to train that, but it typically involves um, a high amount of time under tension. You can either utilize slow eccentric tempos, or you can use high rep ranges. Um, but typically speaking, you won't you won't get a strength stimulus uh, using this type of protocol, but you will uh, increase your strength endurance. Um, so I, I would say uh, messing around with loading parameters like uh, rep ranges and tempos uh, would be a good a good way to enhance upper body endurance. What do you think, Phil? I do. I like it. I mean, I like time under tension in general. You know. Um, and, and the same thing with that lactate retention. I think that that would definitely help. That's a good you know, one. Getting isometric tension for under time, especially after a set, would be perfect for an active recovery tool. But, you know, I take it back to the basics. So I'll go, you know, first we want to improve on utilizing oxygen. So we got to increase VO2 max. Mm-hmm. So that's first and foremost. So we can buffer out buffer out the lactate or so an, use oxygen. An aerobic, aerobic base. You want to build an aerobic base, increase the VO2 first. max. Okay. Yep, yep, first and foremost, you know. Um, then work on that lactic threshold. So we're training the upper body movements, like battle ropes, med balls, wall toss, push-ups, pull-ups, sled pulls. We're trying to increase power endurance, right? So the, the ability to produce uh, force and power for a long duration. That's what I think he's basically meaning when because we're talking about striking. Yep, so yep. upper body endurance for striking. You know, when you're throwing a massive amount of punches, mm-hmm. your shoulders don't get tired, you don't want to drop them. So those types of things. And then all, obviously being more efficient in your sport. So you're probably gonna have to spar and hit pads a little bit longer mm-hmm. and understand you have to you have to do that for a longer duration and learn how to breathe properly. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's one thing that nobody understands is that I can get you in the best shape possible, but if you go out there in front of a UFC crowd and you fucking shit the bed because you have so much anxiety that you end up getting adrenaline dump, I don't give a fuck what I did and what my beep test says, it's not gonna matter because you didn't use your, your energy efficiently. I think the one person that gets the most flack from this is Tyron Woodley because of the way he fights now. He doesn't go out there and try to he tries to kill people all in one shot because he knows he has an, a, an ample amount of time to get the job done, mm. and he knows that he has so much energy output that I mean, he has so little energy output that he can do because he's so powerful, mm-hmm. he's so explosive, mm-hmm. he's highly fast twitch. You don't have enough. You don't have a whole lot of time to you know do this work yeah, before your muscles start power. to die out. Yeah, yeah. So it's not it's not a fact of him not training hard enough or him not training the right ways. That's just his genetic. I mean, it's his genetic disposition and it's his genetic gift. Mm-hmm. The way the way you look at it. So with that being said, I know I went off in a rant. But you have to be efficient with your energy in the skill or in the sport itself first and foremost. And then from there, you can train it correctly. Man, I, th- I think that's a terrific point. Um, just just back to Tyron Woodley. I mean, you know, in his early days, mm-hmm. he was all guns blazing. He was, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, he was a real finisher. You know, that explosive, fast twitch power, you know, like that was on display almost every time you'd see him. And uh, more yeah. recently, especially since he beat uh, Robbie Lawler for the title, uh, mm. you, you're seeing, as you mentioned, a very different Tyron Woodley that steps into the cage. And I think something yeah. also something also happens when you become the champion. 
you're defending the throne. And I think that's a, a very different mindset as opposed to an up-and-comer that's trying to really make a statement and, and, and create an opportunity for themselves in, in the form of a title shot. I think Tyron's now he's sitting on the throne. He's trying to defend that. And I think that's a very different game. It's a very different mindset. And as you say, he's playing to his strengths a lot more. He's trying to conserve his energy. There's all of these things yeah. coming into play. Yeah, I mean, you know, me and him, we talked about this when he came to Coconut Creek. And I was asking him, like, you know, what do you think has changed within this time frame of you getting the title? And he actually said that. He was like, I'm just being more efficient with my outputs because I know that I don't have a lot of time. Yeah. He's like, I may be, I may be quote unquote boring at times and I may get, you know, may get, you know, haggled by it or whatever. But at the same time, I'm winning fights. So who cares? You know, for him, all, it's, all that matters is him putting a W behind his name again, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, and, and then and then they have a good system, him and Dean. They know what they need to do from a tactical, technical, and a strategic standpoint to get the job done, just like they will get the job done, you know, this next fight, you know what I'm saying? And Kamal Usman is, is Corey Peacock's guy, but I think that we got this. I think we're going to keep it at ATT. So, mm -hmm. I know I went off. You know, I got to root for my guys, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to catch up with Corey, see how things are going with Kamaru. Now, that'd be really cool. Yeah. 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 We will after we win this fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, here's another one, all right? You ready? I am. Okay. So, how many trainings per week for a kickboxer would you recommend? How many strength and conditioning trainings per week for a kickboxer would you recommend? Okay, there's, there's clearly no one answer to that because it all depends on the amount of total training units they're doing per week. Um, mm. I can give you an example of what I've seen is optimal for uh, a kickboxer, which is, you know, you've got five, five weekday uh, kickboxing or Muay Thai sessions, so five days a week. And within that, I'm throwing two strength sessions and two pure conditioning sessions. So four strength and conditioning sessions per week on top of five Muay Thai sessions per week. And that uh, okay. sounds like a fairly full training schedule, but what you'll mm. find with, as you get up the ladder a little bit closer towards the pro ranks, that's nothing out of the ordinary. Okay, now in your aerobic training, are you doing that, are you doing concurrent or you are working on one specific energy demand throughout the weeks concurrent i'm using joel jameson's or actually i think it's charlie francis's high low method mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. on uh sure. say for example on a tuesday it'd be an anaerobic based session a lot of sprint work um a mm -hmm. lot a lot of measuring outputs a, a lot of that sort of stuff um working to heart rates you calculating mas all of these things and then for a thursday on example we'll use the low day method which is uh much more aerobic and restorative um, the the other thing the other thing we use in the low day sometimes in the high day as well is the parasympathetic parasympathetic breathing drill um, oh. it, it just really enhances recovery um, you, you, you have the fighters recovering so much quicker after the session returning to parasympathetic mm -hmm. and leaving mm -hmm. the gym in a totally different state to what they would if they hadn't have done the breathing mm -hmm. drill so we're seeing yeah. we're seeing some interesting results there so yeah Charlie Francis is high low method I like that. So that's kind of what I do. It's similar to what I do with the MMA guys too as well. And it, it, it depends on the background and I'll go ahead and I'll dip into MMA. Whereas like it depends on the background of where they are as a fighter. So if they grew up being a kickboxer or a boxer, usually sparring and any type of pad work is very, it's not as physically taxing to them because they're so used to it. They're so efficient in it. Mm -hmm. Right. So with that day, you can kind of use that day if you needed to do in an energy system training on that day you could probably get away with some anaerobic alactic work that day because they're not putting out a lot of energy that day mm -hmm. now if they're a wrestler and they started sparring now that's a little different right so now they're not used to it they start to get hit you know anxiety starts to creep up now that it's highly physically demanding fatigue starts to set in that may be a day where if you needed to do an energy system training that day, maybe that's something where you would do the parasympathetic breathing techniques and the aerobic capacity work 
to bring their body back down a little bit, but still get the adaptations we need yeah. from an from a from an aerobic demand standpoint, right? Yeah, yeah. There is there is so, a way to have your cake and eat it too in that regard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Listen, I in my line of work, you know, you got to make every day count. So yeah, exactly. at the end of the day, so we we make sure that that's that's possible. When you're talking about a kickboxer, yeah, I would say the same. You know, it'd be three to four days. You know, depending on where your schedule is, especially when it comes around the skills training and you want to make sure you're catering your strength training on the opposite days, if you can, of the very hard intensity yeah. skills training. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. All right. It's good. All right, let's go to the next question. Okay. Okay, hold on. Okay, here's a good one. Similarities and differences when programming for amateur boxing compared to an MMA fighter. Oh, come Ooh. on, man. What the hell kind of <laughs> question is that? Who is this guy? Block this guy from your account. <laughs> hey, man. Welcome to my world, man. Let's go. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, Jesus Christ. Similarities. Okay. Um, yeah. the, the similarities are they will be both lifting and they will be doing conditioning. There's the similarities. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, so this is how I broke it down. And because I do have a background in, in amateur boxing, so I know how the energy systems play out there as well, and I obviously have a background in MMA. But amateur boxing is primarily aerobic power, right? And threshold base where the focus is mainly on quickness and repeated sprint ability, you know, uh, where MMA is a mixed all aerobic system mm -hmm. sport, right? We got mixed bioenergetic demands. So they also fight more frequently. When we're talking about amateur, amateur fighters, they yeah. fight almost... They fight almost every weekend, right? So I would stick to more of a concurrent conjugate model because you need to keep them ready at all times. Um, you know, in my opinion, you would want to really find a base. And usually when you're talking about amateur boxers, they're younger kids. So creating a base of strength too as well. And if you have a, 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 a set amount of time to build GPP, obviously that's going to be important, especially if they're young kids. They need to know how to do the lifts properly first before you start to load them with maximal load and dynamic load. Um, now, with that being said, as far as the energy systems, like you, you do want to build that aerobic power, right? So if we can do that, if they're efficient in their energy systems in the fight, remember the fights are about two, I think there's three three-minute rounds or two three-minute rounds. Yeah very quick you know but there's a lot of output right there's a lot of output and they got to be able to produce that output you know consistently for that a little bit amount of time mm. so that's why i would stick to more aerobic power more that repeated sprint ability that a lactic anaerobic work things like that yeah it's a good answer you know because i mean there's so many differences between amateur boxing and mma there's so many differences between amateur boxing and pro boxing you know what i'm saying like, oh, yeah. The output in amateur boxing can arguably be higher because the risk attached to each attack is so much lower. You got headgear on, mm -hmm. you got puffier gloves, you got no head clashes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the output yeah. tends to be a little bit more frenzied in, in amateur boxing. Uh, so, yeah. you, you know, like it's not apples and apples. It's, it's a very difficult yeah. comparison to make. But, you know, well, you, I, I think you nailed that one, brother. That was a great answer. <laughs> All right, so here's a good one. You're probably gonna hate me for this one, but here we go. It's not my fault, I promise. <laughs> what are the best What are the best exercises to incorporate in your program to build single leg strength? Best exercises to incorporate best exercise to incorporate in your into program. your program to develop single leg strength. Okay. Well, without stating the obvious. If if you have mm -hmm. a, if you have a strength discrepancy between left left leg and right leg, identify the nature of the strength discrepancy. Is it a quad dominance issue in one side? Is it a glute dominance? Is it you know? It, identify what it is first, and then um, and then prescribe an exercise to attack that weakness and try and minimise that discrepancy. That first of all would be my approach. Now, if, if, the, if the strength discrepancy, or, or if you wanted to build single leg strength, if you're talking about uh, quad dominant strength, then let's, let, let's get down to brass tacks. We're talking about split squats. We're talking about, you know, 
uh, split zercher squats, split zercher good mornings uh, for, for you, you know, hamstring and glute dominance. Um, you know, one of my favorite exercises is front foot elevated split squat, specifically for beginners because there's so many different ways to load it. Bar on the back, bar in front, mm -hmm. goblet style, mm -hmm. Um, you know, dumbbells by your side. There's, you know, there's numerous ways to load it. You can even hold on to a cable with a horizontal, uh, with a horizontal force angle. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of different ways to load yeah. the front foot elevated split squat. And for me, the best thing about it is that you, you're much more easily able to force the full range of motion with the knee progressing fully over the toe. Um, you know, fully lengthening all of the muscles in the upper leg um, and, uh, and forcing that full range of motion. Because let, let's face it, when we're talking about MMA, you need full range of motion in order, to, in order to both attack and defend in all kinds of positions on the ground and on the feet. Range of motion is, is one of the key factors for MMA. Yeah. So yeah, I would say front foot elevated split squat and identify the nature of the discrepancy. Yeah, a lot of the things that I see in MMA with a lot of my fighters is going to be the inability to have knee and hip extension. Mm -hmm. So utilizing tactile cueing with bands do help with that. Um, whether it be some sort of like TKE version, you can use that front foot elevated split squat or rear foot elevated split squat with the TKE, mm. right? So you're actually so getting the, that terminal knee extension. Sorry, bro, for, for those who, who are unaware, TKE is terminal knee extension. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, sorry, just to jump in there. Yeah. yeah, so the band is pulling you horizontally, right? You have to extend the band, so you're actually activating the muscles of the vast medialis, all the quadricep muscles, and then you're also getting that full knee extension and then from there, if you wanted to increase your hip extension through that, you would obviously tie a band through the hip and have it pulled back yeah. behind you to the rear. Yeah. So now you're getting hip and knee extension. Now I wouldn't do that all at the same time. I've done it in the past. It is, it looks a little circusy, but <laughs> it does help, you know. Um, and we'll do that primarily with a bilateral goblet squat. Yep. You know, we're trying to get full range of motion there. When we talk about full range of motion, that's that's definitely a key. So if you wanted to do that, getting away from just the single leg stuff, if we wanted to get full range of motion, you would do a double band TKE goblet squat with a posterior band on the hips. So now you're getting extension of the hip, you're getting extension to the knees, you're keeping that, that front rack position so they're able to hip hinge properly. And then we're looking for that band to kind of guide our way through to almost keep it vertical shin in a way. Yep, yep. So now with my guys too, they got a lot of, and for me also, man, I do have a little bit of tendonitis in my knee, my wrestlers from shooting all the time, they do get patellar tendonitis. So like laying off of that knee going forward, right? And going over the toe, mm. actually beneficial for them because they're getting more hamstring work yeah. in that way because they're actually able to sit yeah, they're getting able to, they're being able to sit back. And I use this also from an isometric standpoint, you know, basically either loaded or unloaded, we take that band and we actually sit back. And that's a good way to rehab uh, patella tendonitis. Yeah. So we use that too as well, getting into other variations, you know. Now, I reckon that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty advanced, that, that exercise you just spoke about. <laughs> What, what do you think the chances are of you putting up a video on your stories or on your feed about that particular I, I, I exercise? Do. I actually do. I have one on my Instagram um, that is uh, that shows that right before I actually went to squat. So if you guys want to check that out, it is up on my Instagram. Maybe I'll put it in the show yeah. notes. Yeah, we'll put it in a link. It. Yeah, put a link in the description or something. Yep. But yeah, like you said, it's rear foot elevated split squats, single leg RDLs, Kazakh squats, single leg bounds, you know, for, for ballistics and single leg depth jumps, if you have the strength to do so. Indeed, no, that's good, that's good. What else we got? All right, let's go next one. Okay, oh, it's a lot. Okay, here's a good one for you. This might be better for you than for me. Uh, one fight every two months, how do I plan for strength and conditioning to maximize my performance? One fight every two months. Okay, okay. I like it. 
Um, as you touched on before, there needs to be something concurrent happening all the way through because all the way through your training year because if you're competing every other month, um, you may get one block done, one say four week block done, shifting into uh, a second block you know with with a fight just around the corner you're not going to get much done so you need to talk about bang for buck within those yeah. training cycles you've got in between your deload week fight week however however you've got it structured so i would suggest just like phil touched on earlier um, work with some kind of concurrent or conjugate approach where you've got multiple different modalities happening within each microcycle, within each training week. Um, there's, there's a number of different ways of doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think actually, Phil, you'd be better qualified to be talking about the concurrent approach. Um, the, way mm -hmm. I, the way I do it is very, very stripped back. And, um, and it's only been a couple of instances uh, in my career that I've worked with someone fighting that regularly. So I don't have mm -hmm. the greatest amount of experience. So Phil, over to you, mate. Let's go with the, the concurrent approach. Okay, so in the beginning, you know, I take at least two to three weeks to go into a GPP tight phase. So we, got, we are going to build up more capacity. We're going to build up aerobic capacity. We're going to build up some aerobic power. Uh, but we'll be doing things like that uh, German volume training. We'll be doing things like my, like my EDT or my escalating density training. These are just protocols that we utilize for GPP. Pulling sleds, pushing, pushing prowlers. Um, things like that to build up overall strength, endurance, and work capacity. Mm -hmm. Once we get into camp about, you're talking, you say, let's say you get one fight every two months. So when they get into camp, it's usually about six weeks out, right? That's when we're fully starting our conjugate method, mm -hmm. right? So then every, we, we train two times a week, and now this is dependent upon me. I'm going strictly off of me, and we talked about this uh, in the earlier podcast, the podcast was just before this, but what I would do is I would find two days out the week to work on your maximal effort, work on your dynamic effort. Now, if you're strapped for time, however, I've been playing around with this as well and listen up. Okay, so let's say you have Tuesday and Thursday training. Predominantly, you want to wait about 72 hours to abide by the 72 hour rule where you're not working on the same uh, body part for maximal effort and dynamic effort. Now, Here's the way you can negate that or go over that law, okay? You take your explosive power or your dynamic movements, you use only ball throws and jumps. Mm -hmm. So you're doing jumps and throws, you're not really doing barbell lifts that mimic what you did for max effort, but you're still getting explosive power and a little bit of speed strength. So you're still getting the adaptation, but you're not working that same bar movement, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, so on Tuesday, let's say you do an upper body explosive power movement. On Tuesday, that same Tuesday, you're gonna go in the weight room and you're gonna do a max effort lower body movement. So you're getting max effort lower, you're getting explosive power upper, okay? You take Wednesday, I would probably do some aerobic capacity work for some restoration, okay? On that Thursday, you go ahead and flip flop that. Now you're doing lower body explosive power work, which is basically going to be jumps, right? Box jumps maybe some depth jumps if you have the strength to do so, or some hurdle hops, things like that, low level plyometrics, right? And then you go ahead and do your max effort upper body work on that same Thursday. Your accessories and your supplemental lifts are gonna be dependent upon what you did for that max effort lift, okay? Your aerobic work on that day, let's say you're strapped for time and you need to get all the energy systems throughout that day. You work your anaerobic alactic work with your upper body. Mm -hmm. So you're working your anaerobic alactic upper body on your upper body plyometric day. Okay. You're working your lower body alactic speed endurance work on your lower body explosive power work day. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Okay. So we're still working the same energy system for your for your aerobic work as you were with your quote unquote performance or strength work, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're not throwing the organism in two different directions and we're still working systematically through the conjugate model yeah it's good and that's how you get it. all right now on the friday cleanup work you can still do your mobility if you want if you throw in some frc like i do or if you want to just work on joint restoration some aerobic capacity work something that's going to help them when it comes down to longevity and that's what we do on fridays so 
with that being said, how, how you have to also take into account as a fighter, how strong are you, right? If you're very strong, you can take a longer taper. You can taper 12 days, maybe even 14 days without having to lift heavy loads because you'll maintain your strength for a longer time. Now, if you're a female, a lighter female, let's say for instance, I have Tisha Torres, she's been hitting PRs every week with Conjugate. Mm. We've been hitting five, 10 pound PRs every week. And you can see on my IG that she's hitting, you know, she's hit, she just hit 255 on the sumo the other day, okay? And she's only 122 pounds. Mm. So it's, it's going good, right? But for her, I would not taper her I would only taper her about a week to a week and a half out, depending on her weight cut, right? right? But since she's not cutting a lot of weight, we can still keep that strength adaptation going. We can, keep, we can still work on those parameters closer to the fight, which is going to carry over into the fight, and she'll never decay that strength. So it really depends on how strong you are. If you, are a, if you have experience in the weight room, if you are putting up pretty good numbers for a fighter, Let's say if you're zercher squatting or you're, or you're front squatting somewhere around 400, you are pretty strong for a fighter, and especially if you are 185 pounds to 155 pounds and you're hitting a 400 pound squat on a zercher, you're pretty damn strong. If you're a heavyweight and you're hitting in the fives, you're pretty damn strong. Mm. Now, with that being said, if you're not there, then you have to make sure that your taper is a little less, right? So you have you have the ability to kind of work on that strength a little bit closer to the fight because it's going to take you, it'll take you more time, or it'll take you less time to decay that strength adaptation. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? Yeah, it's great. It's great. One thing, one thing I noted there was um, when you're working your max effort days, you're pairing almost like you're pairing muscle types with energy systems, fiber types with energy systems. So real fast mm -hmm. twitch max effort stuff with your high threshold anaerobic uh, sprint stuff, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Yeah. It's Basically, yeah. So, and I wouldn't like. Let's say the way you would mess that up, mm -hmm. however, is if you were to do, let's say, for instance, on a lower body explosive power day, you did, or let's say, my bad, if you did on a lower body strength day, you went and did some uh, anaerobic threshold work on your your um, on your aerobic work. For your lower body, mm. right? So if I was pushing the prowler, you know, creating lactic in, in in my legs after I just max effort lift, now we're in we're in trouble there, mm, right? Because mm, mm. you could cause injury that way, and then you're throwing the organism in two different directions. Remember, a max effort lift, you only got about four four maybe six seconds at the most of strain, mm. right? But when we're working in aerobic in aerobic threshold, we're doing it for a longer time, right? We're trying to get we're getting into higher amounts of energy output. Yeah. Right when it comes down to an overall volume perspective, because yeah, we gotta yeah, accumulate yeah. lactate. So, you know, so you wanna make sure when you're doing your aerobic work, so let's say that day would be more explosive power for the upper body. Mm. Okay, so now we'll work on explosive power for the upper body. We'll do that anaerobic alactic work for the upper body. So we're still working the same energy systems. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it may be something like, it may be something like <clears throat> battle ropes for, you know, a limited amount of time, maybe six to ten seconds, making sure you're staying in that ATP, that ATP range, mm -hmm. and you're not dipping into that threshold work. You know, throwing, like I said, throwing the organism in two different directions and potentially causing an injury down the line. Okay. Just further to that, um, Dan Howard and I were discussing this last week. Uh, you know, under which circumstances would you pair max effort lifting days and aerobic capacity work? I would, I, I, if you needed to do it, I would separate it at least six hours six before hours. or after. Yeah, I can see yeah. that. I mean, uh, my answer to that was, depending on like how smashed the athlete is after the max effort session, might be a good mm -hmm. idea perhaps to put them into some kind of uh, aerobic capacity session just as something restorative to try and down regulate a little bit and try and get them feeling normal again but um mm -hmm. you know that that would be that would be a pretty extreme set of circumstances i think that if you did it in the means of their own skills practice i think that that would be beneficial especially when you're talking about from a 
technical standpoint, right? Right, right. So is, shadowing or something like that. Yeah, and they're probably going to do that anyways. Yeah. You know, most likely most of my guys, I see them down the other side of the gym shadow boxing or doing something crazy over there anyways. Most of the time I'm yelling at them to not do that. But, you know, at the most part, these guys want to train. They want to train as much as they possibly can. Now, with that being said, as long as it's not physically taxing them and they're, like, pushing the envelope on their aerobic work or, you know, something along the lines of that, then, yeah, it's okay. I, I, don't, I mean, you're not going to get the maximum benefit of the overall strength, absolute strength adaptations that we're trying to acquire, you know, um, but it's, it's a small percentage, you know, in my opinion. You still can do it. They do it anyways in a fight. Yeah. You just people just don't understand that. You yeah. know what I mean? So, it's at the end of the day, if they if it's going to benefit them from a psychological standpoint, it's going to to decay fatigue. Go ahead. You know, I prefer you know either ice bath or massage or just kind of diaphragmatic breathing, legs up, something like that, or just going eating. Some quality food, mm. getting your you know getting your carbs, getting your proteins, and going and laying down and trying to take a nap because they got to train the next couple of hours anyways, you know. So, but it's, it, it's, it could it's work. A, it's a good point, you know. Like, go eat some good fucking food. Let food be the yeah. medicine. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I imagine I imagine at the top levels with your guys going through some really serious weight cuts, you'd have some mm. really questionable practices. People you know, undernourished and still trying to recover from hard sessions. And it's like, for fuck's sake, let's eat some good food, get some actual nutrition in, and the recovery will, yeah. will be enhanced so much more. Yeah, like right, out, right after our session, after we do our cool down and they do their, their breathing, the, the next thing I say is go eat and go sleep. Yeah. Go eat, and this, especially if they're like late at night, like I get done with Junior Dos Santos around eight o'clock. I'm like, all right, bro, go home, go sleep. You know, get some food and go to sleep. It's like, okay, coach. You know, but he wants to stick around. He wants to hang out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, bro, go home. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's time for you to rest and recover. You know, but it, it, you got to remember, it's like a family. Yeah, so, like, yeah. they're all here. They're, you know, they're kicking with their friends. And, you know, they just finished a hard workout. So, it's hard for them to just be like, okay, do 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 go. You know, this, this, and this. You know what I'm saying? So, right. at the end of the day, as long as they have some adequate nutrition put in and I'm not saying that they have to scarf down food right after they're done mm -hmm. they're not bodybuilders and honestly that's not really beneficial anyways from from a science perspective mm -hmm. uh, but you still want to go home you want to bring down cortisol you want to start to wind down especially at nighttime because if you're in light and you're playing with your phone or you know you're in a lighted room it's going to be hard for you to calm down and to reduce serotonin and try to bring your body back down so you can go to sleep. Mm. So you want to get in that dark room and you want to shut off all those lights after you're done with your last meal and, sh and at least be at least an hour or two before you go to sleep, shut everything down. Yeah. And that'll be the best way to recover. You know, yeah. sleep and nutrition, sleep and nutrition are, are the best ways to recover, bar none. Mm. You know, so you can do all these other things, but at the end of the day, it really just it comes down to that that you know that whole thing of eating right and sleeping right. So. Yeah, that's that's good, man. I'm glad we got around to that uh, when it comes to recovery. But hey, why don't we take one more question and then start to wrap this thing mm. up today, brother? Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. This is a good one for you. Since you've been in the game just as long as I have. Okay. Well, let me get it back. Okay. Three lessons that you would pass down to the up and coming fitness trainer, either personal trainer or strength coach. All right, okay. Lesson number one, people are strange. They're all different and they're strange. Don't expect people to see things the way you do. You need to be as adaptable as you can to someone else's circumstances, someone else's values, someone else's worldview. Um, be adaptable, because people are strange. There's lesson one. Mm -hmm. Lesson two, um, don't ever fucking steal someone else's ideas. You know? <laughs> you know? We're, it, it, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, to quote Luke Lehman. 
who's a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, like, pay homage, you know, acknowledge those who you've learnt from and, uh, and everyone's happy. Then you, you, you're never going to be worried about being expo- exposed as a fraud or anything like that. Yeah. Just, yeah. just, just acknowledge, acknowledge where you got stuff from. And I'd oh, say, for sure, yeah, yeah. And I'd say the third thing is never stop investiga- investing in your education. Never stop learning. Um, yeah. because you'll see a lot of, um, I don't know if it's an age thing or an old school thing, but you'll see a lot of coaches when they get to a certain point in the, their career, it's almost like they switch off and they go, mm-hmm. they go into autopilot. They're kind of sleepwalking. You know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. no passion there, probably because there's nothing new, stimulating new ideas and growth and you know, different ways of doing things. So I would say be, be always investing in education and never stop learning. Is my top three. That's good. That's good, and it kind of goes off of what I what I have too as well. And you know, I gave him four. You know, just to be <laughs> of course the overachiever that I am. <laughs> um, you know, I always say this, and it's almost like I'm quoting Gary V. And that's what we're talking about giving giving examples. And I, if you guys don't know who Gary Vaynerchuk is, it's a guy who is a, a multi media marketing genius, in my opinion, but he's very practical. And he always says, stay patient, right? Patience is something that all of us need to have. I don't care if you're 20 years old or you're 50 years old, you need to stay patient in your approach. Now, with that being said, still don't be complacent. There's a difference, Mm. right? Being complacent is, oh, I'm cool with where I'm at and I don't need to grow or, you know, progress in any way, shape or form. No, you be patient while you're progressing, right? So don't over overthink things. Don't get frustrated. Don't think that things need to happen right away, right? Set it up to where you are going to increase your overall ability to to be successful each and every day. So that's one, okay? The one. other one, obviously, the other one, like you said before, is keep learning, keep growing. Find other ways to keep learning. It doesn't always have to be just in this field. Find other avenues to learn from, whether it be history or, or psychology or sociology, whatever it is, business, whatever it is, you want to increase your neural capacity to learn mm-hmm. and to and and to broaden your spectrum of thinking, right? Yeah. That's two. It's good. Okay. Be fucking active. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have to be active. You cannot sit on your ass and think that things are going to get done. It's not gonna happen. I drive 90 fucking minutes every damn day to go to American Top Team. And that's there. I go back to, that's two hours. Now, what do I do with those two hours? I'm constantly learning on the go, right? I have audio books, I have, and this goes back to keep learning. But with the end of the day, I'm being active in my approach to keep learning. It's isn't isn't it's that three. three hours? Three hours? 90 minutes each way is three 90, hours. 90, yeah, yeah. Yes, three hours. Yeah. I mean, I really, I, I, I speed. I'm not going to lie, I speed. So I'm going to get it there too. <laughs> I'm trying to get home, man. Fuck all that. <laughs> so it may be an hour, you know what I mean? But if you calculate it out, it's 90 minutes. You go know what I'm saying? Sometimes I, get, sometimes I get home in an hour. <laughs> uh, with that being said, like I said, I'm always active and I'm always doing things in my community. I'm always doing things online here with you guys. I'm making sure that I'm staying active in my approach to coach, and then I'm also being active in my community and other things that I can be benefit that I can benefit from, but other people can benefit from me. Okay. Three. Now I'm gonna give you the extra one, and this is something that we are doing right now: mm. is we're providing content, mm. right? Provide content so that people know you know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah, it's good. The only reason you guys, and I'm talking about the listeners, are listening to me now is because I put out massive amount of content to make sure that you guys understand how to do this properly. And I'm only doing that, and honestly, I'm only really doing that because I want to create awareness on how to actually train and coach these types of athletes. Now, with that being said, I also want to make sure that you understand the proper ramifications of what you're getting into. So I'm going to give you some advice here and there, and I'm also going to give you some practical knowledge and some motivation to get your ass up and keep these things going. Because yes, it is going to be tedious. It is going to be monotonous at times. And you're going to be like, fuck, man, I got to do this thing again. But at the end of the day, trust me, it will work. And I've been telling you this. Remember this when we were in Australia, I was saying the same thing. You got to put out 
things that make you look or make people realize you are doing the right things. Because mm. in all honesty, if you're trying to bro- grow a business and if you're trying to help people, you need to provide that solid content, that solid education, that information, and be somewhat of entertaining in your approach. Don't be fucking dry and me sit up here and talk like this and not have any, you can't do that. I gotta be lively. I gotta be, you know, someone who's going to be like, damn, I really wanna talk to this person. I like this guy. <laughs> I like this Phil Drew guy. He's got a fucking beard. He's got tattoos. He kind of talks, you know, kind of talks a little bit hood. He may sound like he may have a little bit of black in him. These types of things happen. <laughs> Yes, and with, day, with that energy, you've got to look after yourself, you know what I mean? That energy doesn't come from nowhere. I mean, it's, there's a lot yeah. of factors there to, to stay on top of your game, to stay present, to stay active, to keep putting out content. There's a lot of energy in what you've recommended people do. So I, I guess that's all underpinned by looking after yourself first. Oh, yeah. Health, health is by first, by, you know, in my opinion, I've seen it happen in, in, in the past with me myself is I did put this on the back burner and I, and we talked about this, I throw myself into the ground, you know, um, it's, it's, it's something that you need to be on top of and you're right, man, your health is obviously important because if you don't have the energy, you can't do any of these things that I was just talking about. Mm. So good, uh, good add on to that one, man. Mm. Yeah, for sure. That's, All right. uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those little nuggets there, brother. That was that was really, really cool. All right. And yeah. uh, so what we'll do is next week we'll finish with the rest of these questions because mm-hmm. I got to go. I got some bench pressing I got to do. Cool. And it seems like you're going to enjoy your lovely Saturday there in Australia. Most and I'm going to go ahead and finish off my Friday night here in Florida. So... Thanks a lot, brother. We'll uh, we'll get back to this next time next week. Any announcements you want to go ahead and shout out? Uh, no announcements right now. We've got a couple of things in the works, but why don't I touch on them next week? Cool. Sounds good, bro. All right. Thanks, you guys, for listening in. Uh, we'll see you guys next week, and we're going to keep this thing going, man. I promised 100 episodes. 100 episodes. We're going to get it. That's right. That's right. All right, guys. All right. I'm out. See ya.